Alrighty, uh, Apocalypse Now this week, uh, an American film, late 70s, directed, produced, co-written, Francis Ford Coppola. Uh, it is epic, epic in its scale, it's wide, it's powerful, it is, um, it, it is everything that next week's film isn't in terms of scope. Uh, so next week's film, Do the Right Thing, all happens, takes place on a street, a neighborhood, and, and that's done for very specific narrative reasons. Here, it's just wide, it's rambling. You go on this journey with the film and the filmmakers. Um, it is a story uh, that's, that's speaking to some of the issues about the Vietnam War. It's set in that time frame. Um, the, the, the story structure is such that once you get through a pretty lengthy setup, you end up joining the protagonist on a boat and, and the journey begins. It is a trip up the river, and that is kind of a metaphor for a journey into oneself. This comes together when, um, when uh, Sheen and Brando uh, hook up in the, in the last scenes there. This is a, um, uh, it's an epic to make it as well. Here's a quote from uh, Coppola at the film festival. Um, the production was actually budgeted for uh, taking about five months, ends up taking over a year to film. Uh, there is a really good documentary that his wife makes um, and is released after the film is released. Well, one of these big challenges is that anytime you're going to make a film and it's not in, in the studio, you've got to transport everything. So people that do call sheets, you need makeup, you need costumes, you need tons of lighting and camera gear. It's, it's a logistic, logistical challenge just to get the whole operation. And here they're going into the Philippines. Um, and, and you, you, you know, if they, if they lose film, you just, you don't run downtown and uh, pick up a new roll of film. So, uh, that's part of, uh, the, the challenges that he runs into as a director. Um, besides that, he has, um, his relationship with Brando from The Godfather. Um, but, but Brando just doesn't appear to be, uh, that engaged with this, uh, this pr uh, project at all. He's got to fly to the Philippines. He shows up late. He's overweight. Uh, he doesn't have his line memor memorized. Um, now part of that is because, um, Coppola keeps rewriting the end of the film, um, which is where, where Brando's role, uh, um, is, is at. So he, he shows up Brando, uh, just not really having an idea what's going on. And he only has three weeks of Brando's time. It's very expensive. And for the first number of days, they really just sit and try and create, uh, a, an ending that both will be satisfied. Um, weather comes in, Typhoon destroys all the sets that they've built. That has to be redone. Um, his first leading man is Harvey Keitel from uh, a lot of Tarantino films. Keitel is a really good, good actor, but he just doesn't fit in this role. And, and what Coppola is looking for is he wants this protagonist that, that the uh, Sheen uh, eventually gets hired for. As, as more of a passive, uh, passive observer. And, and so we connect with him as we're watching this journey take place through him. Keitel's a bit more of an aggressive actor and couldn't play back and, uh, and restrain himself and became too engaged in the process. And that wasn't going to work for Kovala. So to, to be there, uh, have a, have a budget like this and, and be in the Philippines and decide at that point, this isn't going to work with who you originally thought it would. It's a big deal. It's a big deal to then stop production. He's got to come back to Hollywood and find a new lead actor. He shoots <laughs> at the end of the day over a million feet of film and over 200 days of filming. That's fantastic. He gets nominated for a, a bunch of Academy Awards, actually wins uh, uh, for cinematography and sound. We're going to look at both those aspects, plus director, writer, uh, in this film. There's enough to cover in, in everything. 
Um, he gets originally funded uh, through Hollywood sources, but ends up having to put um, almost everything he owns, uh, he has to mortgage uh, to continue and complete the film. $31 million in $70, and um, it ends up grossing $150 million worldwide filmed in the Philippines. Again, set during the Vietnam War. Uh, the war itself uh, is... Um, is interesting from a historical standpoint. Not so if if you are Vietnamese, uh, I would imagine uh, challenges all around there. And and of the three million calculated to die this time, over half are are civilians. There there is a scene where they come upon um, a small group of uh, French folks that are still there, and this goes to the history of the country. Uh, the French are there uh, before they leave, and and then the U.S. comes in. Uh, the U.S.'s built, military buildup is the 50s, and then they uh, they are out in 75. Um, you've all seen footage of, from this time period. It it, it uh, the war itself becomes a flashpoint for uh, the generational and philosophical divide. Um, that took place in the country, uh, and this film reflects that. The, the narrative itself is less linear, so while the structure is chronological, the story itself becomes a little bit like a painting. Um, it, it, you do have to participate. It's a journey that you uh, are intended to make, um, and, and what you want to look for at it is the cinematography, the painting, the dancing, how it leads to this climactic scene, and the music that they use from the time to get there, um, as well as some uh, some classical uh, music as well. Um, it, it, because it deals with war, uh, this personal journey uh, in this environment, um, it's not a carefree movie in that sense. Um, and you can see one of the film critics' uh, comments there. Um, there's, there's three versions of this at least uh, released in the United States. Um, the redo now and then uh, within the last couple of, of years, uh, the final cut. You can watch any of the three of them. Uh, the first one is is the shortest in length of, uh, of time. Uh, the redo is the longest, and then now the final cut falls between them. Um, there's some storyline that gets cut out of the redo uh, from the first one, um, but for for this week's assignment, any of the three will work based on your level of interest. Um, Here's the specifics on um, uh, the production schedule, cinematography, when it begins. A year and three months, and for most of that time, they're on the road, except for the part when uh, the typhoon hits. Everybody kind of comes back for a break, but that's just a year plus, almost a year and a half, uh, filming um, one one project and out of the country is phenomenal. It's a it's an incredible commitment to uh, to the project. So things that you're looking for in the cinematography, it is vast. There's lots of wide angle shots. Um, it is a big screen film. I mean, we're going to watch it uh, either on a t television or on your computer. Um, if you ever get a chance to watch it in a, in a theater, um, it'll be um, in even more enhanced uh, experience. It, there's a ton of movement. Of course, it's a war film, so that you have movement within the frame. You have uh, camera movement as well. And then you have tons of classical uh, lines from the film as well. Martin Sheen uh, does a phenomenal job in the film. Um, he actually... Uh, uh, um, uh, suffers a heart attack uh, partway through the film. They have to shoot around him until uh, until he heals. Um, there's a, there's a good clip I have in the context videos of uh, of uh, Coppola working with him in one scene. It's a good watch. 
Robert Duvall, uh, classic character, um, is uh, uh, um, in the helicopter scene. And then he actually is the same character back from um, the uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. He's Boo in that. You can see uh, Lawrence uh, Fishburne, who goes on to Matrix and all kinds of uh, uh, other films. He's really young. I think he, he kind of lies about his age at the time to get the job. He's only 14. Uh, you'll see Dennis Hopper towards the end, he, him from uh, Easy Rider. Um, and then uh, Forrest and Bottoms both play uh, key roles. Then, of course, Brando. He has this cameo role at the end. Um, he, he, If you watch any of the behind the scenes, it's just uh, it, it would have been a, a significant challenge to work with him and to get him uh, to perform uh, as he needed to. So where we looked at Brando earlier in the semester with On the Waterfront, and you can see a cut, focused, chiseled actor. Here it's rambling. Um, it's, it's not focused. Um, he's not exactly sure where he's going, and, and it comes out in, in the film. Um, <clears throat> he's not happy with how the the film is uh, written to be uh, ended. Neither is Coppola, and they spend some time trying to write that. But in the field, uh, with production crews and everything uh, waiting around, not really the time um, to do your best writing. Uh, so you can see one of his quotes, and what what they do is they just start filming and. They see if he can deliver a performance um, almost spontaneously. Um, Copley is one of the writers. There's another great Hollywood writer that does the original screenplay. Uh, but because Coppola is a writer and, and he gets writing credit on, a, on another epic film, Patton, um, I don't know if that's a great thing for a director because you always think that you can solve whatever problems that you're running into in the filming by rewriting, and that certainly uh, is taking place here. Talked a little bit about uh, the editing. Um, it's 100. It turns out to be around 101 ratio. So for every 100 minutes of film shot, only one minute makes it into the film. Now, <clears throat> this isn't extraordinary. There's other films that kind of have this ratio, but it's just phenomenal. And think of it in terms of time. It takes a year and three months to film it, and we end up watching three hours. Um, so a, a phenomenal undertaking. I do uh, want to speak to sound. It's one of the key things uh, with this film. And... <clears throat> One of the the gentlemen that's brought on is an editor, and um, he's really interested in sound design. And he becomes the, one of the first guys that that even uh, gets the title of sound designer. Now it's a pretty common thing. You don't roll out a feature film without investing a lot of time and talent, and money into sound. But here, uh, in in the mid seventies, late seventies. Um, sound is really just beginning to take place. One of the one of the challenges that filmmakers ran into was they were willing to spend time and money, and they knew what enhanced sound could do for their film. But um, uh, movie theaters weren't set up to replicate that sound that they wanted, uh, and that becomes a big battle between filmmakers and then uh, the folks that own theaters is to improve that uh, sound capability. Uh, here's a quote, um, and this is what Merch is doing. He spends as much time uh, reworking sound as the editors do in, in cutting the visuals for this. Um, he does get to do a Dolby stereo 70 millimeter mix. Um, and um, this is really important for the development of film and the, the role that sound plays in it. So Merch is an important name to remember. He's also written a really good book just about editing for those that are editors. And kind of what we're tracking here is Star Wars, which just rolls out a couple of years before this, is the first one with Dolby sound. 
Uh, this movie is the first one to have a stereo surround sound, and it's a 5.1 mix. These are all things that we take for granted and we hear now. Uh, this is the first film uh, to be distributed widely to use that. Um, and again, you know, the, the problem with theaters is they were used to just running dialogue um, for To Kill a Mockingbird. You don't need 5.1 sound. You do need good dialogue speakers, and that's pretty much all they had. 90% <clears throat> of the film uh, sound was recreated in post back here. Uh, they didn't have the tools. They didn't have the the sound uh, engineers in the fi in the field to to get everything they need plus filming helicopters super loud explosions uh, moving through the jungle like that um, so merch and his crew um, do what they call fully and recreate uh, gun blasts explosions engines um, and, and of course the Huey the helicopter sound um, <clears throat> which is in almost every scene in the film. There you go. <clears throat> That's a background on the uh, apocalypse now. Head over. I want you to watch a few things that I pulled out for you in the context and then hop into this film. All right. Thank you. See you next week.